Hey Shagheads, Curtis Tucker here, aka Shags, with a long lost episode of A Shaggy Duck Life, which I think I may be shortening the podcast name to uh, Shaggy Life. So I think I'm going to be working on a Shaggy Life brand. And so I'm still, I apologize for not having an episode out for a long time. And that's basically because I'm just not sure what my hook, my niche, my audience, my topic is. It kind of is all over the place, but uh, I think I'm honing in on that and I should have that all together hopefully soon. But what I wanted to do was uh, do this episode as kind of a cautionary tale of a big adventure I had this last weekend. Some of you have listened to the 70s Buzz podcast where I tease the eye, the story and then over on the Buzzhead radio podcast, I kind of explain how I ended up getting my phone, wallet, credit cards, cash, uh, driver's license all stolen in Phoenix, Arizona. And um, rather than having that episode go super, super long, uh, I left out some tips and things that I could have done different, should have done different, and I'm going to throw those into this episode. I am going to kind of repeat the story, so uh, the beginning of the podcast is going to be a lot like what you had heard before. So you might, uh, if you're just here for the tips, you might want to zip through that really quick, but... Uh, there may be some stuff I add or uh, have remembered since the Buzzhead Radio episode, but I apologize for making you guys hop all over the place to different episodes, but I thought this one would be kind of important to uh, give you guys you know, some foresight, which I wish I had had, and it would have saved me probably a lot of trouble, but uh, it will save me trouble in the future and so this was a learning lesson so this is the tale of losing my iphone license and money so uh so i'm again i'm just going to kind of go over the story the story begins when one of my wife's uh, first cousins his wife contacted us because he was turning 50 years old and she wanted to throw him a surprise party in phoenix arizona at a resort and they live in Washington. They had lived in California, moved to Washington, and then his sister, another first cousin, lives in California and is married. And then uh, my wife's brother lives here in Oklahoma. And so there's basically four couples that are all first cousins uh, or brother and sister. And so she contacted all of the couples and invited everybody out to the um, Phoenician Uh, resort in Scottsdale, Arizona. And this was months ago, so this was on my calendar of of things coming up. I didn't exactly know what we were going to be doing. Uh, I just knew we were flying to Phoenix and we were going to surprise him. It just so happened that uh, the weekend that she had planned was on the same weekend as an OU football game. And because this is our oldest daughter's senior year, we didn't want to miss Uh, you know, very many games, and this was her first, her last first game, and she's uh, captain of the Palm Team. So what we did was we uh, drove to Norman last Friday, spent the night, got up, and went to the 11 o'clock OU football game, uh, sweated it out there, and watched the game, and then kind of got our things together and immediately drove to the airport waited for the flight, and then we flew out of Oklahoma City and flew to Houston. Houston, we had, I think, about an hour layover, and then we flew from Houston to Phoenix, and we arrived at Phoenix at 10 p.m. Phoenix time, midnight Oklahoma time. And uh, my wife had been toying with the idea of uh, renting a car, but because we were going to be there a very short time and we didn't didn't know of any time that we would need the car to like drive out of the resort, we didn't. So she booked an Uber uh, while we were in the airport in Oklahoma City or in, well, maybe when we got there. Um, and so that was our first Uber ride. Everything went well. We just threw the bags in. The guy uh, drove us to the resort, probably about a 30 minute drive from the airport to the resort. Uh, he was quiet, didn't really talk, didn't say much. So anyway, we get there. Again, it was fairly late. So basically we just went to his room, surprised him. 
then he kind of knew everybody that was going to be there and then we headed off to bed and so the next day um, it was during you know a couple of days before this she had told us that she planned a float trip on Sunday so we arrived late Saturday so on Sunday so what we did was we planned to all go to breakfast in Scottsdale on Sunday morning and then go to the float trip on the Salt River uh, in Mesa which is close to all of those and so basically we uh, they had rented a car and so we took that rental car um, actually we stopped at a well we went and ate uh, it was a really cool restaurant I can't remember the name but it was a rest uh, kind of a brunch breakfast uh, restaurant where they have a live DJ and they also have these huge uh, Bloody Mary's like uh, huge bacon strips and beef jerky and corn dogs and meatballs and celery basically a whole entire meal you, you go make your own uh, sticking out of this bloody mary so i'm not a bloody mary fan so i just had a regular uh, grand slam breakfast everything was good went from there to the liquor store um, loaded up on some liquor because they had bought a an inflatable cooler which we filled with ice put all the drinks in um, took four of us. It had four handles on it, so we carried that uh, to the vehicle and then to the uh, place where you got on the bus. And so the bus would take you to the area to get your tube and then right where the, uh, the floating trip would start. And so as we were going they had they had recommended that you take um, closed toe shoes because of rocks and, and things like that so I had on uh, some hey dudes had on my swimming trunks and a t-shirt and a hat and my prescription sunglasses and I decided to leave my shirt just one less thing to have to worry about we didn't take towels again just something else we didn't have to worry about um, when we were in the vehicle, uh, I was debating whether to take phone and wallet and everything, but I knew I wanted to take pictures because, you know, it's an adventure and I'm a blogger and I wanted to blog and social media posts and all that. So I knew I had to take my phone and I didn't know if the float trip had been paid for. So I wanted to take some cash, my credit cards, and then I didn't know if there would be somewhere along the way or, or something that we'd get ID'd. So I just went ahead and, and decided to take all of that. Um, my brother-in-law had a clear plastic bag that had these blue edges on it where you could slip an iPhone in and clip these black clips at the top and it would keep it waterproof but, and you could still use the phone within the bag and it, so it kept it waterproof. Uh, there was just enough room that I was able to slip my wallet uh, down the back of where the phone was. And so I clipped it and I had that and that's basically the only thing I was carrying other than the tube when we got to the tube area. So I stuck the clear plastic bag in my swimming trunks which aren't super deep pockets so it was kind of sticking out a little bit at the top but I thought cool so we get to the tube launching area we all get our tubes um, we put on a whole bunch of sunscreen and then we get down into the water and it's just not very deep it's probably a foot two foot deep uh, you can see a couple areas that might be just a slightly deeper um, you can see rocks and it's not really flowing that strong so you could sit in your tube and put your foot down and kind of stay in one position or you could paddle enough that you know you didn't get away so we all got in the water uh, had the the floating ice chest and so what we decided to do was kind of all group together to kind of have fun and be able to hand each other beers and to talk and to be able to hear each other and so we kind of made our way to the middle of the river and, and started floating all as a group. So uh, everything was cool. We were cruising along and uh, I kind of looked down. And so, you know, when you sit in the middle of a tube, your your butt in the middle of your body kind of sinks and, and 
everything in the middle kind of starts to get wet, but it kind of fills up the whole middle of the tube. And so I, I saw that my pocket was starting to get wet and I didn't want to take a chance of my, really my wallet, because the phone is supposedly waterproof also, but I didn't want my wallet to be wet and the credit cards and the cash and all that. So I took the bag out of my pocket and I laid it on my lap. But again, like I said, there really wasn't at the time, it just didn't seem like there was anywhere that the phone in the bag could go. It just, my body was taking up the whole middle of the inner tube. And so, so we were cruising down and everybody had a drink. And so we only, you know, basically only had one hand free as we were cruising along. And um, it didn't take very long uh, that it started to get a little bit faster, you know, not very far from the beginning. And the water got a little deeper and got a lot faster. And what we noticed was there was a bend in the river. Um, and so what happened is as a group, now if we'd been in individual uh, inner tubes and been paying attention, you could have paddled and stayed in the middle or gone to the left of the river and made the corner really gently and, and kept going. But because we were all grouped together, we couldn't control it. And so the quick rushing water took us to the far side of the river and where the bend is. And on that side, it was like a rock wall. There was rocks and uh, a lot of bushes with limbs sticking out. And then there was kind of some big rocks in the water that were sticking out that you kind of stand on. Uh, and then we noticed there was these guys that were kind of standing there. And then as, as a group of people would hit the wall, they would kind of push people off. But you know, once you hit the wall, it was kind of like a, it was a madhouse, you know, people started tipping and some people were falling off their tubes and they were dropping things. And, and so what we, what, when we realized we were about to head to the wall, uh, we all said, Hey, let's paddle. And so we were started to paddle really quickly to try to see if we could stop ourselves from hitting the wall and, and go down the river. Uh, of course we were going by that time, we were going too fast, but I think what happened was right at that moment, I think I leaned really way over uh, in my tube to try to paddle. And I think at that moment, that lean caused a gap. And of course, the lean caused the bag and the phone to drop, slide out of my lap into the water. Well, it was the worst, fastest, deepest, uh, worst part of the river that we went on all day long it, and it, but it wasn't a very large area, but so, so as soon as we kind of bounced off the wall we were all kind of laughing and joking and everything was kind of fun. And then we started drifting down to the river where it went straight again. And just as we were getting past the really fast water, I looked down and I noticed that the bag was gone. The, the first thing was shock and panic. And then the next thing was, oh, I stuck it back in my pocket. And then when I realized I hadn't stuck it back in my pocket, I mean, without even thinking, I think I, I yelled a couple of profanities. And then I asked my wife, I said, do you have your phone? And she said, yes. And then I jumped off of my tube and started swimming. And um, like I had said on the Buzzhead Radio uh, podcast. I think if I hadn't have been in, you know, decent shape, um, you know, I could have caught, get, got caught in the undercurrent or I would have been washed away down the river. And it just, it took everything I had to just swim a few feet and stay where I was. And so finally uh, I started to wear out a little bit and I knew it was just too strong and I wasn't going to be able to swim completely up to where I thought I had possibly first lost the phone. Now, I thought the phone was heavy enough that it probably dropped and then you know, it probably drifted a little bit, but probably went straight down. And then once it hit the rocks on the bottom, probably is just was sitting there. Um, and at that point I didn't know how deep it was. So anyway, I got to the edge and uh, was able to stand on a couple of rocks and use the limbs of the bush that was uh, the bushes that were sticking out. And I kind of worked my way back up to the area where all those guys were. 
And when I got up there, I noticed that um, several of the guys, the non-English speaking guys, had dive masks on and they were diving in and they'd disappear for a little while and they'd come up. And so in panic mode, I uh, started asking them, you know, can you dive in? And I, I lost my yellow and I called it a yellow iPhone because it was in a yellow case. And I said, it's, it's bright yellow. It should be easy to see. And they would shake their head at me and, um, you know, say that they couldn't speak English. And so for a couple times, I, I tried to walk in and, and watch my feet and see if I could see anything yellow. And uh, then I would kind of dive in and, and put my head underwater. And, and at one point, I got a little bit too far in the middle and it swept me back down. And again, I had to swim and uh, caught a hold of the side and worked my way back up again. And then I think I slipped and it, the water hit me or maybe some people hit me and then I tumbled and I've got, I mean, I've got scrapes everywhere, all over my body um, and went back down. And at this point, I did not know what had happened to everybody else in my party. I kind of assumed that because of the, the speed that we had come off that wall that they had probably, you know, had to go a little further down and I didn't, have my inner tube, so I didn't know how deep it was, if I was gonna have to swim to catch up with them, but uh, you know, panic mode had set in and I knew I was gonna need a driver's license to get on an airplane. I needed my phone uh, and I needed, it had, uh, so, so in my phone, uh, well there was my phone and then in my wallet there was three debit cards, uh, three credit cards, uh, $200 cash, my driver's license and my insurance card. And so um, I just I just couldn't fathom the thought that I was just gonna leave all that at the bottom, you know, of this river. And so I kept asking different people, and then there was some guys that that could speak English that were telling the guys in the dive mask to go find my stuff and they just weren't putting in a huge amount of effort to find my stuff. And, and then there was kind of an, uh, this American guy that was kind of there on his own and he had this big stick and he said, yeah, he said, I've been doing this for 30 years, been coming here. And he goes, you know, the problem is people uh, get all grouped together and then when they hit this wall, they can't control, you know, what's going on and they drop stuff. And I mean, about that time, this nice, expensive looking Bluetooth speaker drifted up to him and he picked it up and he said something to one of the guys and he said something back and and then the guy that had the speaker said well go get so and so and so basically it kind of dawned on me that maybe these guys were in that area to collect all of the stuff that got dropped and there was a lot of stuff getting dropped i mean there was other people searching for their phones there was ice chests there was cans uh, shoes, just all kinds of stuff uh, that was floating there. And so I kind of got the impression that these guys were collecting all of that and kind of like probably keeping it. A couple of times when I had washed back down the river, I noticed a group of people that had were kind of camped out there. And I kind of wonder if maybe they weren't kind of people that were collecting the stuff to maybe fence the stuff later or, you know, I don't know. I, I, I don't know, but that's what it appeared to me was, you know, they weren't intentionally stealing stuff off of people, but when people drop stuff, they were diving in and snagging it and going away with it. And so, so anyway, I don't know. I must have stayed there for half an hour or 45 minutes trying to find it on my own, trying to get these guys um, to find it. And uh, at one point they said they had found it and I kind of went down and this group of people that I think was collecting the stuff, they had a pink phone and I said, no, that's not mine. And it kind of dawned on me that maybe I should have said, yes, that was because whoever person that phone was, was probably not ever getting that phone back either. Um, and so uh, all of a sudden I heard somebody yelling my name and they were yelling, hey, your phone is over here. And I looked up and it was one of my cousins and they were kind of directly across from me in kind of the deep area, but it was on the other side of the river that was flowing a lot slower uh, because it was the inside curve of the bend. And they, he said that they had used my wife's GPS to track it and he knew exactly where it was, but it was like, 
he thought it was around 12 feet of water. So I told a guy in a uh, dive mask, you know, I will pay you if you will go down and get it. And he wasn't understanding. And so I, I swam back down and, I, and my wife and the party that I was with, they hadn't gone very far. They were kind of just just not very far. I hadn't realized it. Had I realized it, um, I should have gone down to them immediately and started tracking my phone with her phone. And I would have probably noticed that it was slowly working its way. The force of the water was causing the phone to work its way down the river a little bit. And so my wife said, you know, here, you know, the reception out here is kind of sketchy. So the GPS is not, so, you know, on 360 or find my iPhone, if somebody's driving, you literally can see the dot moving. You can see exactly where they're driving. This didn't have a good enough connection that it only showed where my phone was for a point in time and then it didn't move and then you had to refresh it and then it would show the phone at a slightly different location. And so it wasn't like my phone moving was live where we could actually track where it was going and the bright sun made it really hard to see the phone. So anyway, I got her phone and from where we were standing on the, the, the faster side of the river, it looked like the phone was across the river and to my left where one of my cousins had been searching. And so I was getting ready to get on the tube and head over there and I hit refresh and all of a sudden it looked like the phone had moved to the right of us across the river. And that's when I started thinking, oh no, this GPS is not very accurate. And when if you move, it causes the other phone to kind of, you know, it causes the GPS locations to jump around. And I thought, you know, there's, I may not even be able to get very close to where the actual phone is. And so I hopped in the tube and I, I paddled across to the other side and I just threw my tube up on the ground and I looked at the GPS again, hit refresh, and it actually showed the phone on the land, like literally a few feet away from me. Now, the problem was, I don't know how much time, you know, I don't know if, if that last location was three seconds ago or five minutes ago. And so, so I, I started kind of looking around the shore to see if there was anybody there and if anybody might be holding a phone or if it was laying anywhere. And uh, my cousin came up and I said, hey, it's, it's showing it's over here. So we actually went up the bank uh, and it was just this big rocky area that they'd put these stones down and there was nobody up there. There was a path that went up to a parking lot um, and then there was a kind of a line of trees and then the bank and then there was a lot of people along the bank by the water but there was nobody up in that flat stony area and there was, you could just look and you couldn't see any phone but it, the GPS was saying my phone was right in that area. And so um, I kept walking around and as I would walk around, the, my GPS seemed to move, but it, it wasn't really moving. It was like I just, I kept going past the area of where it said my phone was and then it would make it look like it went that way. So what I decided, to, and my cousin had, I think he had figured out what had happened. And so he went up the trail and he was gonna go check the trash can in the parking lot up uh, that was ahead of us. And so I decided to take my wife's phone and move really slow until her icon was exactly over my icon. And so I did that and I was looking around and it was just obvious that there was nobody there and there was no phone there. And so I was like, in my mind, I'm thinking, wow, this GPS uh, is just not good enough. Literally, my phone is probably still in the water we're not gonna be able to f get really close to it with GPS, so I may be sunk. And then all of a sudden I look down and I see this clear bag under a rock. Just, you know, kind of a, a smooth uh, round rock. So I move the rock and there's this pl clear plastic bag with blue edges on it, but nothing at the top. So I pick it up and it, had, it was my brother-in-law, so it wasn't like something of mine that I was used to, but I was like, this, I think this is what I had my phone in, but it had a black clip at the top. And so 
I looked down again and sure enough, there were the black, the two pieces of the black clip at the top on the ground. So obviously somebody had found the phone and instead of you know yelling, hey, does anybody missing a yellow phone? And they, I mean, we'd been there at least an hour. So I think everybody in that area knew we were looking for a phone and uh, whoever took it, I don't know if it was, I, I don't think it was the, the same crew that was on the other side of the river in the bend. I think this was somebody that just happened to be along the shore enjoying their day. They had driven, they probably weren't even doing the tubing. Um, I think they just saw it coming their way and or maybe even had dove in because they heard that we were searching for it and found it. Um, but anyway, they took it up the bank for some reason, decided to take it out of the bag. Um, and I think at that point they turned it off and went and got in a car and left. And so because I had my wife's phone, I immediately uh, was able to track it to where I was standing, but then on find my phone, there's an option to be able to mark your phone as missing and kind of lock it. <coughs> Excuse me. And so that's what I did. I locked it. And then I quickly from the shore started calling the insurance or the uh, banks and the credit cards. And I literally pretty much got everything canceled pretty quick. Um, and at that point, uh, I knew the $200 was gone, all my credit cards were gone, my license was gone, my phone was gone, but at least I knew that they were gone. I knew what happened to them, I knew they were gone, I knew I had no way of getting them back. And so then I was able to kind of relax, take a deep breath, and uh, went back down and they were kind of, at that point, everybody was kind of yelling like, hey, if we don't go now, we're not gonna make our bus. And so, um, jumped in the water. We ended up having a great time going down the Salt River. Uh, there was never another area like that area that was really fast and threw you into a wall. Um, a lot of the area after that was so shallow that if you didn't lift up, um, you got rocks um, up your butt. And uh, But it was a great time. We got to the end uh, hopped on the bus. They took us back to our car. We took the car back to the resort. Um, it was a little weird, you know, no wallet, no phone, uh, not able to take pictures, not, didn't have anything. I mean, you know, it, it is a little weird, but I must say you can live without a phone and your social media and you'll be just fine. So uh, we went out to eat that night, uh, had drinks, had a great time. Uh, we took uh, just an aside, I think I, I told about it on the Buzzhead Radio. We took our second Uber. It was really cool. The guy pulled up. We got in. Uh, my wife, my brother-in-law and his wife got in, all from Oklahoma. And the guy was playing Billy Joel's Piano Man really loud. So we got in and I said, oh, wow, great song. And he says, oh, you like that? He goes, you want to karaoke? And we all looked at each other like, yeah. And all of a sudden, there, we noticed this little mirror ball, the top of his Uber, and the mirror ball went off. And he uh, had a sparkly, glowing microphone that he handed to us. And basically, the entire ride from the resort to the restaurant, we sang uh, Piano Man. Great time. It was fun. Had a great meal. Uh, the next day, uh, oddly enough, the next day, um, they must have turned the phone back on, but they weren't able to get into it, but they turned it on and um, so the GPS came back on. So I knew I could see, and my daughter had texted and said, I, you know, I can see where your phone is. So we knew the exact address of the house where my phone was in Phoenix. And um, I had pushed the button uh, the erase feature. And so basically, if they turned the phone on and tried to connect to the internet, as soon as it connected to the internet, it would get a signal and erase everything on the phone. So, so up until, I'm recording this Thursday night, up until last night, which was Wednesday night, the phone was still pinging from that house in Phoenix. Like every... I don't know, 30, 10 minutes, you know, just odd times. Um, but it stopped at about midnight last night. Um, but it still hadn't erased everything because they had not gotten it on 
to connect to the internet. And so I, what well, I'm guessing maybe the battery finally ran out. They didn't have it charging. And so I've been checking all day today on Thursday and it has not, uh, there's been no new ping from that house or anywhere. It still says that it's at that house, but it's, it's got the time from last night when it was last able to connect. And so, um, so anyway, uh, I'll just add this real quick that you didn't hear on Buzzhead Radio. Um, what I decided to do, what, what I got to thinking that maybe the it was just a, a theft of opportunity. You know, they whoever got my stuff wasn't there to specifically find stuff and make money off of it. I think possibly they were just there enjoying the river, the sun. They saw the phone and the wallet and the money. Uh, it was an opportunity, so they took off with it. Um, it could have even been somebody young um, that was that lives with their parents. So, so what I decided to do, just for funsies, to add to this adventure, I wrote a letter today, basically saying, "Hey, I know my phone has been at your at this location since Sunday. Um, it was taken from the river. Everything has been turned off. Nothing works." Um, we, but you did get $200 cash. I have not reported this to the police yet. Um, would you consider sending, since you do have my $200, would you consider sending the phone back to me, gave them my PO box, uh, and told them that, you know, there was some photos that I'd taken from the OU game and the weekend. I, luckily I'd backed all my photos up, uh, the Thursday before and so I was really only missing the photos from the weekend but I would really like to have those and so I in the letter which I mailed to the house where my phone was showing it was and it just said to whom it may concern so hopefully if it's apparent they'll open the letter and anyway um, sent that letter uh, I think they'll either get it Saturday or Monday the post office gal said Monday for some reason I think they might get it uh, Saturday but um, I'll keep you informed. I, I'm guessing I won't get the phone back and I'm guessing I won't hear from them, but uh, I thought, you know, you just never know. So I did that. Uh, so the rest of this is, is really why I wanted you guys to come over here to this podcast. Um, here's some of the things that I learned and uh, some tips that I wanted to give you guys of, um, you know, what happened, what I ran into, problems I ran into, and, and things like that. So anyway, basically here, I'm going to start out with a list. I think I've got 19, and I may be adding to this, but I just want to, and so don't forget this, not only is this a podcast, but uh, I am recording a video on this. So this will be on the Curtis Tucker uh, YouTube channel podcast, YouTube channel, and I have typed out a blog post at curtistucker.com, and then I will embed the YouTube video and the podcast onto that blog post as well. So there's a whole bunch of different ways you guys can listen to this, um, but here are some tips that I would recommend, and and I just did not prepare for this trip. I, I just, they said, we're going, we're booked. I said, okay, I went, and that was it. I, I I literally didn't know exactly where Phoenix was. I didn't know where Scottsdale was from Phoenix. I didn't know, you know, I did, I think, look on a map before we left to find out exactly where Scottsdale was, which is basically just right there uh, as, you know, part of Phoenix. But I didn't look to see where the river was, and you know, nothing. So here's some tips that the next time you guys are going on a trip or a vacation, Hopefully this will help you uh, to learn from my mistakes. Um, and then a lot of this has to do with if you go on a float trip, but sometimes if you just change the word float trip to amusement park or you know mountain climbing or you know you can almost all these rules kind of apply to just about anything if you're going away from your normal home and where you have access to everything. Uh, so the first thing I would highly, highly, highly recommend is I don't think enough people back up their phones, their iPhones or Android. So the first thing before you leave town is back up your phone, which I did. Now, I the iCloud backs up my apps, um, my email. Well, my emails are on Gmail, so they're in the cloud. 
Um, I think my messages, or, you know, I, iCloud takes care of a lot of things except my photos. I don't have my photos go to the cloud. I basically plug my phone into my computer and have all my, save all my photos to an external hard drive. And so luckily, and it had been a long time since I had, I, what I wanted to do was sync my photos and be able to delete. I think I was up to like 12,000 photos on my phone. And so I wanted to make sure I had plenty of room, even though it's a one terabyte phone, I wanted to make sure I had enough for new pictures and video and all that. Um, so I synced my photos Thursday night and then spent a little time Thursday and Friday deleting a bunch of photos off of my phone. So be sure to um, back up your phone before you leave on vacation. Um, find somewhere, uh, get all of your social, your credit card, debit card, get all of your account numbers, get your credit card numbers that are on the card, um, get your debit card numbers and put them all in a digital file. It could be a, a Word file, it could be a, a you know, the notes on somebody's contact. I mean, just somewhere hidden where people aren't really going to find it and um, put it in the cloud somewhere where you have access to it uh, in case you lose your phone. So uh, you could get to it with somebody else's phone or with your laptop or an iPad, but just have a place with all, it makes, it makes everything a lot quicker if you have access to your account numbers and the numbers because nobody, most people don't memorize the numbers on their credit cards and debit cards. So have all that in a file. Um, really nobody can do really anything with it. As don't put your passwords with it. Um, so, but, <coughs> you know, don't have it marked, you know, credit card account numbers, you know, have it kind of hidden somewhere. Or just write it down on a piece of paper and stick that in a suitcase and, uh, have that, you know, have it hidden in a book or something somewhere. Uh, number three, put your account numbers. Um, let's see. Da, 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 da. I'm actually on number four. Write your passwords in a secure, secure location, but one that you can access. So keep your passwords separated from your account numbers, but um, do have, I know there's some apps out there that um, keep track of all of your passwords. Just have somewhere where your passwords are because if your phone gets stolen and you have a laptop or you can access a public computer, you know, you're going to have to have a password to get into your Gmail or your Facebook. Um, and I'm going to throw this in here a little early. What one of the most fr frustrating things that I had was I hadn't used my laptop in a while and I had the browser Firefox open and I do things from certain accounts in that, but then I also have Safari open and I do other things in that account. For some reason, Firefox had logged me out of just about everything, but those were my main accounts, my Facebook and my Gmail. And I was able to access my passwords and get try to log in on my Facebook or on my laptop to get into Facebook and Gmail later that night, but I had double authentication, two-way two, two -way authentication on, well that second authentication is they send you a code to your phone and then you have to type that in. Well, I didn't have my phone so I was unable to get into Gmail and my Facebook account um, that night. Um, so anyway, so but have your uh, passwords written down somewhere if you have to log in without um, where you usually keep your passwords. I would suggest taking a second device like an old iPhone. I do have two iPhone 7s sitting here and I didn't take either one of them. Um, I should have charged one, at least one of them and taken it with me. Kept that phone separated like in a suitcase or a carry-on or uh, you know just somewhere. I, I, so I got there and literally all I had was a laptop. Um, I did not, I usually have maybe an iPad and another iPhone. I don't know, for some reason I just didn't, I didn't take much. So, but uh, taking a second device, um, an iPad or a laptop is a good idea. Um, and so, but again, you know, kind of keep everything separate. Pack a second form of ID, preferably one with a photo and address, uh, even a utility letter with your name and address on it, a prescription bottle with your name and address on it. Um, they can help, especially getting through TSA. Now they're not going to get you through like you would with a driver's license, but it's going to eliminate a little bit of the time and a little bit of the questions. 
I, I have a, a, a business bag that I keep my laptop in. I, had, I didn't have anything in there. I have no prescriptions, so I have no prescription bottles. Um, none of my utility bills were in there. I had another, or I, I had zero form of ID. I had nothing to show who I was. And so I would suggest scattering some things, you know, library card, voter card, if you're, uh, you know, a member of Costco and they have a, a picture card. Cards like that keep, you know, hidden in different pieces of luggage, uh, you know, so if one piece of luggage gets stolen, you've got more, you know, more things with your ID in them. Um, don't keep all of your cards in your wallet or purse. Store some in the safe or in your luggage in the room. So, you know, my super, super big mistake was taking three credit cards and three debit cards with me on the river. I mean, sure, you know, in the case I needed one, I should have taken one and left the other five either in the vehicle you know, when we parked, which would have been risky, somebody could have broke in and stolen them. Of course, if you do that, you know, hide them somewhere in the vehicle, but I should have just left them in the safe in the room. Um, I did split my cash, so the $200 cash was not all of the cash that I had, so I actually did have a little bit of cash when I got back to the room, so I, I was smart enough to split up uh, some of my cash. Um, if you're not driving, uh, but again, I didn't... Uh, you know, to buy the alcohol on the way to the river, I did need my photo ID, my driver's license. So, um, but I should have left my driver's license in our vehicle uh, before we got in the river. But again, I didn't know if I was going to need it on the river, so I took it. So, uh, don't carry all of your cash. I already said that. Um, pack. Uh, I'd say in your luggage somewhere, you might want to pack a watch, an extra watch, or a uh, a clock because if you do lose your phone and you use that to tell time all the time and use it as an alarm, um, you know, most rooms do have the old timey alarm clock, but you know, if uh, I go running every morning and I had no way of keeping track of what time it was. And um, so uh, I didn't have, I had, did not take my, um, I, or yeah, I, I did take my iWatch uh, my Apple Watch, but it wasn't charged. So I did charge that, and that did help out a little bit. I was able to, when I got into Wi-Fi areas, I was able to read texts on my Apple Watch that were still coming in. So that was, and emails. Um, so that really helped out. So you might want to have a backup uh, Apple Watch or, or some type of watch like that. Um, Type the serial number of your phone into a file, again, that's either up in a cloud or on a piece of paper. That way you can identify your phone when you report it stolen. Um, make sure all iPhones are registered on Find My Phone or 360. <coughs> now, a lot of these tips that I'm giving you really change if you don't have a spouse or a relative with you. If you're just on your own, uh, man, I, this would be a lot rougher, um, you know, without an extra phone. So, so basically all these tips I'm giving you, and especially this one is if you're there with your spouse or relative. So basically have everybody, so every device, every Apple device that we own is on Find My, I think it's just called Find My app. And so I can track all of my AirPods, all of my, I've got three iPhones, I've got two iPads, an iPad mini, I've got laptops, that Find My tracks them all. You click on device and it shows me, it shows me where my girl's AirPods are, it, it tracks everything. Everything that has power, um, you can track. And so make sure that you put everything, all those things, and have them tracked in that app. Um, you might want to take an old camera, a camera phone or water, waterproof uh, GoPro. Had I had a camera, I might not have taken my phone. I could have uh, just taken a GoPro. I do have a GoPro uh, right there. I didn't take it. Um, even this old, had I thought about it, this old iPhone 7 would have been perfect for just taking pictures on the river. I should have taken an old iPhone, left my good one. Um, and so take an old phone or an old camera. Uh, if you don't want to take your phone to a river or, you know, you could lose it on an amusement ride, but if you have a GoPro or an old phone and you're on a roller coaster and you lose it, it's not as big a deal as if you um, lose your main phone. So try to try to find an old backup. 
um, set up an alternative number or backup codes for your two-step verification on apps and websites, especially like Facebook and Google. So when you set up that two-step verification, it says, where do you want the code sent to? And most people say, my, my phone. But then it gives you also alternative places as well, like your spouse's phone. Or you can actually tell it that you want to give it a pre-made code already. And if you write those codes down, when it asks for the code, you already know the code because you had already pre planned it so it's just you can google and um, youtube and TikTok more about that but um, the two-step verification is really cool keeps people from breaking into your accounts but if you don't have your only form of verification it keeps you from getting into your accounts which is kind of a pain um, if you're going on a, on a river ride, do take uh, closed toe shoes. Uh, so you, when you're walk, especially when you're walking from the river to the bus to go back, it's it's probably going to be really rocky and and all that stuff. So take that. Um, I would highly suggest if you travel a lot and your phones are expensive to keep insurance on your phone. We had AT&T insurance on our phones, which meant if they were lost or stolen, AT&T. Um, would replace them. Come to find out, uh, I didn't read the fine print, and or you know I wasn't didn't read any print and wasn't thinking about it. But you don't just get a free phone; you get um, a refurbished phone from AT and T, not a new phone from Apple. You get a refurbished phone from AT and T for the deductible of two hundred and fifty dollars. And when you call them and say, I, my phone was stolen, they'll say, okay, we'll send you one, you know, the same specs as yours, but not the same color. And so basically they send you whatever color they want. So my, I think silver iPhone 14 Pro is now purple, which is fine because I keep it in a case and I really don't care. And purple's not a bad color. So hang on, let me get a drink real quick. Uh, my throat is getting dry. I don't mean to drag this out forever. I'm going to try to start wrapping this up. Um, let's see. Have a list of phone numbers for credit cards. Yeah, so basically what I had to do is use my wife's phone to Google, you know, Sears MasterCard and Chase, Visa, and, and to get those 800 numbers. If you have them all written down or in a file somewhere that you can access from a spouse's phone or a laptop, you can get to all of those phone numbers really quick. But highly recommend if you feel like your stuff has been stolen, turn your phone off as quick as you can. That was the hardest hardest thing was to know that I was erasing my phone and um, all of the ringtones, all of the settings, all of, you know everything was going to be gone. Um, and basically, because I back up my photos on not in a cloud, none of the photos came back, you know, so every everything, my apps came back and, you know, things are a lot different there. It's not an exact copy of what your old phone was, but none of the photos come back because I hadn't backed any of the photos. So I guess, you know, maybe I suggest uh, backing your photo photos up to the cloud. And then if your phone is stolen and you get a new one, the photos come back. Um, I kind of like cleaning them out every now and then. So, uh, plus, I've got like 82,000 on my uh, external drive, and they that would not all fit on my phone. Um, once you've made it to your destination and you're ready to go on your excursion or float trip or amusement park, here are some tips, um, some more tips. Um, put valuables in a waterproof bag or container and keep a leash on it. Um, you know, have something attached to it that's around your neck, even if you're on a roller coaster. Um, you know, put your phone in one of those clear bags and you can hold it up and you can uh, video yourself. But as long as you have that leash around your neck, if you accidentally drop your phone, um, I mean, a simple $5 leash, um, I'm trying to think of the other name um, that they call them, but, you know, a $5 one of those would have prevented this whole thing. Um, but again, I didn't go prepared. I wasn't thinking. I, I had kind of thought about what I was going to put some stuff in that might float, um, you know, but I didn't. So uh, if you put anything valuable, make sure it, there's somewhere where you can clip it, somewhere where you can put it over your neck, something like that. Um, don't, I would suggest, and I think, 
I did not. Um, I would not wear rings if you're going to an amusement park or a tube ride or things like that, especially tubing because you're you're pushing water, you know, and if it's hot and um, or if you've lost some weight and your ring gets a little bit loose because of the heat, um, and if your ring slips off, yeah, nobody's finding your ring in, in those you know, there, there are dive teams, I think, that you can hire that sometimes go and look for stuff like that. But, man, I would suggest not wearing rings uh, to anything like that. And I did leave my ring uh, at the hotel. Uh, leave your hotel key in the vehicle. Um, don't take it with you. Not, uh, the, you know, and don't leave it on the dash of the car that you brought. You know, hide it somewhere where, you know, if somebody were to break in, you know, they're just going to look really quick in the console and the glove box. So don't put it in one of those unless you can lock it, but, you know, slip it somewhere. Um, but uh, don't carry your hotel key with you. Um, hide a spare key in a magnetic box under your car, your rental. So that way, um, if you do take your keys and you lose your key, I would recommend not taking your keys. But if you do take your keys, again, have them in a bag or on a lanyard or a leash around your neck so you don't lose those. Um, but it, it wouldn't hurt to have a spare key in a magnetic box in case for some reason you did lose them. Um, but have it hidden, not somewhere obvious under the vehicle. Uh, I would take cheap sunglasses that float. I had, I don't know how, I don't know how I made it through that whole ordeal, didn't lose my hat or my prescription um, sunglasses. So had I lost my sunglasses, I would have lost, they, they were my glasses, I would have lost, you know, the ability to see clearly. Um, but somehow through all of that, um, I kept my glasses and my hat on. Kind of crazy. Uh, leave a extra pair of prescription glasses in your vehicle. So uh, I did take two pair of glasses. I had my prescription sunglasses on. My prescription, regular subscription glasses were actually at the hotel, but uh, might not be a bad idea to leave them in the vehicle, especially if you are the driver. Um, and then here's another list. If your things get lost or stolen, here are some tips to make life easier. Uh, use a family member's phone to mark the iPhone lost, which locks it uh, with a passcode. Track the phone with the Find My phone app, and uh, maybe you can find it if you go after it really quickly. If you can't find the phone, use the erase feature, which erases everything on it when it gets on the internet service. Uh, immediately call your banks and your credit cards. Um, and then you also probably need to call your phone service provider, uh, ours is AT&T, and let them know that the phone was stolen and then that way they mark it as stolen. And if anybody tries to use it at any uh, cell phone provider, it pops up as stolen and they can't use it. Um, things that you won't have if your wallet and phone are stolen or lost. These are just some of the things that I didn't have. Um, I didn't have a clock. Um, I didn't have my morning alarm that was gone. I didn't have, an, if you use a sound machine or sound to go to sleep by, I didn't have that. I didn't have any of my music, although um, I think I did have some music on my Apple Watch. Um, but you won't have all your songs that are on your phone. Um, if you don't have another device, you're not going to have your contacts, you're not going to have your messages, you're not going to have your voicemails things that you could lose on your phone. So like I said, um, I got, I've gotten a new phone already. You know, this happened Sunday, today's Thursday. I got my phone yesterday. Um, but some of the things I've noticed that weren't on my phone, of course, my photos weren't on there because I don't back them up to a cloud. Um, the text messages that I got in Phoenix on my Apple Watch, um, are still on the watch. Well, no, I had to erase the watch to pair with the new phone. So I lost the messages that I'd gotten in Phoenix because they did not show up on my phone. So there could be a weird little area in there where you lose some messages and emails and stuff. Um, my app settings, I lost a lot of those, like Weatherbug and the Weather app. You know, you have like four or five cities set up. All those are gone. I'm gonna have to reset up all those. Um, logged in status on your apps, you know, normally if you open up uh, an iPhone, you just go right into Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and all that. If you lose your phone and it re-downloads all those apps, you've got to re 
enter and re-log into everything. So that's why uh, you definitely need to have access to your passwords. And a lot of those are gonna ask for that two-step verification. So be ready for that. Um, but um, you also, like I use iMovie uh, a lot. All the projects that I, that I had saved where I had the beginning and ending and music already on and then I would just slip new videos in. Um, all of those are gone. Um, they haven't come back. I'm not sure if those are backed up on a cloud anywhere. I'll have to check on that. But they, at this point, they're gone. Um, you know, there's a couple of design apps where if I filter a photo, I'm, a, I'm able to put my logo or my watermark on a photo. That's gone. I had to re-upload that to one of those design apps. Um, my ringtone settings have changed. So my daughter called and her ringtone was different. So you're probably gonna have to go in and reset up all your ringtones. And these are just the things that I've noticed immediately. I'm sure there's gonna be a lot more things over time that I'm gonna notice. Um, and then I've got another section here, which is on the blog about uh, you are able to uh, get on an airplane and get through TSA with having zero uh, identification. I kind of told you guys, um, met a really great TSA supervisor, uh, Andre Burton, and he and I uh, got along really good. Um, he got me through there. Um, so basically, you know, they'll ask you, do you have any other form of ID? And they'll go down a list of prescription bottle, utility bill, uh, other form with a picture. And I basically had to say no to everything. And so if you don't have anything, they have you sit at a table, the supervisor comes up, he asks you the same questions. Uh, when they realize you don't have any form of ID, you fill out a sheet of paper, I think, my, and they could all be different at different airports. Mine, um, basically just asked name, address, birthday, and I think phone number. And I think that was about it. And then he calls into a number and he gives them that information. And then they come up with a set of questions. And then through him, he asks you questions. And, you know, I don't want to give away the exact questions on everything. I don't, it's really nothing you can prepare for because I think they probably change up the questions you know, every time or depending on what information they have access to. But it's things like, you know, the last four digits of your phone number, what car do you own, what car uh, did you own before, what car did you own before that, uh, name a close relative, how are they related to you, um, where was your social security card, um, uh, uh, ugh, your social security card issued, what state was it issued from, you know, just questions like that that you should know the answer to. What I would say is take your time, think, and try not to answer wrong because my guess is if you answer a few questions wrong, um, they may not let you through. Uh, it's not an automatic that you're going to get through. And so, like I said, I was able to answer all the questions fairly quickly, didn't get anything wrong. Um, I did not, you know, cause a ruckus. I didn't get mad. Um, I took it in stride. Uh, for me, it was part of the adventure. Um, and so once you answer all the questions, uh, the people on the other line will say, yep, that's him. Uh, we've got enough proof that that's him. And so then the TSA supervisor will have you go with him through the line. He'll kind of clear a path for you, grab a bin, a tote, you put your stuff in there, you do the, go through the scanner. Um, they will pat you down, um, just a little bit extra security because you didn't have a photo ID. And then they set your tote down at the end of the deal and um, they take these little, uh, oh, I don't know, things, strips, and they swab everything in your tote and put it on the strip and then put the strip in this machine and check for you know, powder and explosives and things like that. So every, and they go through all your bags, any bag that you're carrying on, they will search, they'll look through everything. They might pull a couple of items out of your bag and they'll test it. Um, so, so, you know, um, expect a lot more security to get through. You're not gonna get through really easy without any identity. Um, here is a couple of tips. Uh, to get on an airplane with no identity. Uh, arrive earlier than you normally would. So you're always gonna arrive, you know, hour and a half, two hours early. I'd get there three hours early. Uh, give yourself plenty of time. Um, have your spouse, when you get up there, 
don't put your your name on one bag and your wife's name on another bag if they allow one person to check two bags because that's what we did. My wife, not thinking, printed out a thing with her name and a thing with my name, put one on each bag, and as we were walking up, she realized that, oh, if I put both bags up and pretend like they're mine, he won't have to show his ID at the bag check. Well, unfortunately, she had already put my name on it, and so the guy was like, well, you can't check this. It's got his name on it. He said, can I see your ID? I said, I don't have an ID. <coughs> he said, uh, okay, I'll take your bag, but uh, you're going to have trouble at TSA. And with a straight face, without smiling or anything, he said, you're probably going to get strip searched. And he, he said, yeah, with our TSA here in this airport, uh, you'll probably get strip searched, which made my wife and my sister-in-law really nervous. To me, it was just going to be another part of the adventure, I think. I think the guy was kidding, but just didn't want to let us be aware that he was kidding. I think he wanted kind of it to be a lesson, um, but no, they didn't even mention strip searching. So it uh, was not strip search, but um, arrive early, have your spouse put, if you can, if one person can uh, check two bags, have your wife or your other significant other put both bags in their name, then you don't have to show an ID at the baggage check. Go straight to the, um, you know, the terminal, uh, start the process, uh, let them know that you don't have uh, ID. Um, and then once you do get in, uh, I was told not to leave the secure terminal, like to go to another terminal or to go out, you know, to the main part of the airport, because once you go out, they are not going to let you back in without ID for at least 24 hours. So you're going to miss your flight. Um, lessons that I learned throughout this whole ordeal is uh, beware of those uh, two-step authorization uh, on your accounts. You may have trouble um, getting to, into your accounts even if you have an extra um, laptop. What I didn't have was something that had apps on it. I had a laptop. So you're going to need something with apps on it that can kind of help you get those uh, verification codes. Um, I learned that the AT&T insurance had a $250 deductible and they gave you a refurbished phone from AT&T, not a brand new phone from Apple. Um, as bad as it seemed at the time, as panicked as I was in the water, um, it's really it wasn't really that big a deal. Um, it's just more of a pain and just a lot of having to run here and run there and, and wait on things to get resent to you. But um, it's really not that big a deal. So don't, don't make it the end of the world. Um, you can survive without a phone. I made it all the way back uh, from Phoenix on the plane uh, without my phone. I did have, um, I did have my Apple watch. So I think I played, I think I played music from my Apple watch. Um, but, uh, you can make it without scrolling Facebook and TikTok and all that stuff. Um, I did find out that GPS tracking is actually very accurate. Uh, that GPS, my wife's GPS put me straight center over that bag where they had turned my phone off. Um, so GPS tracking really does work. Um, and don't forget that you can always turn a bad situation into an adventure. And so that's what I did. So that's kind of the end of this blog post. Uh, hopefully I have entertained you uh, and also given you guys some tips and information uh, to think about for your next trip. Of course, on my next trip, uh, I will plan it completely different, take a lot of extra stuff. So I'm going to get off of here before we go too much longer. And I apologize for the lack of episodes. Um, I think I've kind of got a theme building of things that I think I would enjoy talking about and that you guys might enjoy hearing. As of right now, it's still just kind of behind the scenes and these little adventures that I go on. And again, I may be changing a Shaggy Duck life to just shaggy life and that way it's it's a lot shorter hashtag um, the logo will be a lot easier I can do t-shirts and stuff like that so be looking for a name change of the the podcast to shaggy life and hopefully this will inspire me to do some new episodes I appreciate you guys coming to you from right here at shaggy duck studio in Enid Oklahoma you guys have a great day or evening and I will talk to you soon see ya